it's ready for you. Good Shabbos, Shabbat Shalom. I'm Rabbi Ed Feinstein. This is Valley Beth Shalom, Torah study for a Shabbos morning, a beautiful springtime Shabbos morning. Joined this morning by my dear friend, Rabbi Mark Gelman from South Florida and newly appointed rabbi of the Aspen Jewish Congregation. Mazel Tov, Mark. We're all coming in the summer to crash on your floor <laughs> and enjoy your shul in the summertime because Aspen is as close to heaven. It's where God spends the summer. So Mazel Tov to you. Yeah, you and see, if I took a job in Cleveland, you wouldn't be saying that. If I took a job in Poughkeepsie, you wouldn't be saying, oh, we're coming to visit. But Aspen, oh. Okay, let's go see what Gelman's doing. Let's go see what Gelman's doing. We're all coming, Mark. We're all coming. Anyway, good morning, everyone. You're Shabbat welcome. shalom. Hope you're all taking very good care this time. The news, and of course, that surrounds us is so deeply depressing and difficult. Terrible. So we want to join with everyone around the world in our prayers for peace, for security, especially for the children, for the families of those who have been bombed and rocketed and, and displaced. All of our prayers are with those families and especially with those children. And we pray that somehow rational minds might take hold of the world and give us back some sense of stability and order. So pray with us to get together for, for peace tonight, for today, and, uh, and for wholeness. And uh, this week, of course, we're going to be celebrating the festival of Purim, wonderful holiday of Purim. It'll be on Wednesday night. So wherever you are in the world, find your way to a Megillah reading. It's probably a wonderful way of expressing our anxiety and our pain over the news in the world. Because uh, at the end, I'm going to give it away, but Haman gets it. And uh, and Mordechai and Esther are triumphant, and we get to eat humantash and drink a little schnapps. So uh, let's celebrate a holiday, a sweet holiday of Purim. This week, we open the, a new Bible book, a new book of the Torah, the third book of the Torah, which is the book of Vayikra, in English, the book of Leviticus. It is a very different book. Uh, the books we have read so far, Breshit and Shmot, Genesis and Exodus, are both books that are characterized by narrative. Even though parts of Exodus are law, parts of Exodus are instructions for the building of the Mishkan. The book of Leviticus is not narrative at all. There's only two very small spots of narrative in the entire book of uh, Leviticus. It is instead the instructions to the priesthood about how the sacrifices ought to be offered. At least that's the first 18 chapters. And Till we get to Kedoshim, when a different kind of literature uh, will, will arrive for us. Now, what do we do with this? How do we understand this? L let me just sort of frame it, and then I want to ask my dear teacher, my friend, uh, of why this matters to us. I put it in this way. The sacrificial worship of ancient Israel was what you might call a highly articulated form. There are things that we human beings do where there's a lot of room for spontaneity. There are things that human beings do with a lot of room for creativity, but there are certain things that we do where we don't leave room for too much creativity or spontaneity. That is to say, it has to be done right. I remember teaching my son how to play chess, and I taught him how each of the pieces on the board move, and we started playing. He was about five, six years old, and he moved one of his pieces in exactly the wrong way, and I said, Yona, the piece doesn't move that way. He says, mine does. Because, <laughs> because for a kid, you know, like, why do these rules matter, right? But in certain art forms, in modern dance, there's a lot of room for spontaneity and creativity. It's less so in ballet. In ballet, it has to be done right. It has to be done properly, right? In, 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 in massage, you can have lots of creativity. In surgery, it has to be done right. There's certain forms of human expression where the form itself imposes itself upon us and our loyalty to the form is an expression of the aesthetic of that particular form. And that's what sacrifice is. It's like ballet. It has to be done right. The word that occurs over and over again in the book of Leviticus is liratzon, which literally means that you do it the way it was supposed to be done. There isn't a lot of room for the priest to do a spontane spontaneous, creative, original initiatives. It's got to be done according to the rules. It has to be done right. Now, having said that, that explains this literature. You see, because in, in, every, in, in many, many human endeavors, there is what you call a shop manual. If you've ever taken your car to the mechanic and the car isn't, the mechanic isn't familiar 
with working on that kind of a car or that kind of a problem, you will notice that he will refer to a booklet published by the Chilton Corporation, which tells him how you fix the car under these circumstances. It tells him what the, you know, how to tighten certain things and how to adjust certain things and how to set reset certain things. And the Chilton manual tells him how to work the car, right? Your banker has a manual says how he uh, sets up certain kinds of loans and certain kinds of documents. Lawyers have these manuals. Doctors have these manuals. Rabbis have these manuals. It tells us how to do stuff. Now, here's what's interesting. A shop manual or a professional manual tells the practitioner how to do it. It doesn't tell him why. When I graduated rabbinical school, I was presented with a copy of the rabbi's manual tells me what you say at a bris, what you say at a wedding, what you say at a funeral service. In order to know why you say that, you had to have studied hundreds of pages of Talmud, which is what we did in seminary. But at least having studied the Talmud, I know that this is the right way to do it. Well, that's what we have in Leviticus. We have a shop manual, a professional manual that was given to the priests of ancient Israel about how to offer worship, how to offer sacrifices. So it tells the priest which animal, how the animal should be sh slaughtered, how the animal should be prepared, how the animal should be cooked or roasted, how the animal should be divided. It doesn't tell him why, because it's a shop manual. It's not the why book, it's the how book. Now, the really interesting question is, if this is the secret shop manual of the ancient Israelite priesthood, how did it end up in the middle of the Torah, which is a book given to all of us? My mechanic will not show me his Chilton manual because it removes the mystery of the fact that he knows how to fix the car and I don't. The banker doesn't show me her manual, right? My doctor, well, if you press the doctor, they'll show you the manual because these days everybody shows up in a medical office with recommendations, but doctors, lawyers, bankers, mechanics, ballet dancers, surgeons, they all have shop manuals. The priest would have had a shop manual. But what does it mean that the shop manual was published? It means that this belongs to all of us and that the esoteric quality, the mystery that surrounded the priesthood at a certain point in Jewish history, the community decided to open that up to everybody, opened it up to everybody. Maybe that was done in response to Moses's famous statement that we are mamlechet kohanim v'goy kadosh. We're all of the priestly background and therefore esoteric wisdom isn't becoming. It should be shared with everybody. Maybe it was a democratization. Maybe it was on the day that the temple was destroyed and the rabbis or the teachers of the community were afraid that this stuff would be lost when the priesthood went away. Let's return now then to this manual, to this, this very detailed description of animal parts. And let me ask my dear friend, my rabbi, Rabbi Gelman, why, why is this here? What does this teach us? What is the meaning of sacrifice in a day and a time when we don't do animal sacrifices? And frankly, we're, they're kind of distasteful. I, I would be kind of offended, so in your shul, coming up to shul, where there was blood spritzing every place, the way it must have been when they did it. Why do you suppose this is here? And what is the deeper meaning of this? Yeah, and the decorating committee would be angry at you for splashing blood on the walls, which was part of the ritual. Right. Say, Rabbi, we, we got, could you just splash it in a, in a Ziploc bag or something? Yeah, this is one of the great mysteries of the transformation that every one of our students should know about. It's the most important transformation in the history of Judaism. It's the transformation from biblical Judaism to rabbinic Judaism. In some ways, it's actually fair to say they were two different religions. Not totally, because the underlying beliefs are the same, one God and, and so forth, and the Ten Commandments, of course, are the same. But when you look at Leviticus, there is nothing, nothing in it that looks like the Judaism of our time. And in, and in, uh, in fact, in the six Siddharm, the six orders of the Mishnah, an insane amount of time is spent by the rabbis 
with this question, why are we talking about the Korban or why are we talking about the sacrifices? When the temple is destroyed, the priesthood was essentially exterminated. So there weren't even priests to do it if they had the temple, which they didn't. What are we doing? And in fact, one of the uh, orders of the Mishnah, Kedoshin, is all about this. And then if you look in uh, Tractate Hagiga and Yoma, and I think in Pesachim, there's also a bunch of stuff where it's also about the sacrifice. So what, what were they doing? What, and the rabbi said, why are, we, why are we studying this? There was a big dissent. And <clears throat> so the answer is the formal answer, and then there's the Gelman answer, okay? So the first is the one that all rabbis are taught, and it's sort of the, the standard meme, and that is, the rabbis invented prayers to replace sacrifices. Very simple. What we're reading in this parsha, there's five. There's five korbanot. There's the, the burnt offering, which is actually technically translated as Holocaust, of uh, the Ola, the Mincha, the meal offering. Zevach Shlamin, the, the, uh, the peace offering, which, by the way, was the only offering that could be eaten by non-priests. All the rest of it, were, the Ola, nobody ate because you ate, you burned up everything of this a big cow and ox. And it was oxen, goats, and sheep and meal. And there was also, they burned some frankincense, which was a deodorizer, basically, because you have the smell of the inside of animals is not a pleasant smell. So there's burnt offering, meal offering, peace offering. There's the uh, the sin offering, the chatat, and the guilt offering. Asham. And they they made prayers for all of this. And so then, but the rabbis ask brilliantly, well. What does it mean we replace a, a sacrifice with a prayer? Is a prayer a sacrifice? And they were very well aware that a prayer is not a sacrifice. When you say, you know, rise for the Aleinu, there's no sacrifice except maybe if you have sore knees. There's no sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice. What is a sacrifice? A sacrifice is giving something of value. Basically, in those days, something you could barely afford, but you gave it out of your free will love of God and Judaism, and you gave it to the priests. And that was, you know, temple dues, what we call temple dues today. That's how the priests lived. And, they, and it was an inherited priesthood, which is another difference between biblical and rabbinic Judaism. The priests inherited their kahuna from their fathers, their Jewish identity eventually was from their mothers, but you've got whether you're a priest is from your father. And then the rabbis also invented the prayer books and they invented the, the, the Passover Seder and they invented a whole bunch of new beliefs. Olam Haba, which I speak of way too much and, and all of that. So anyway, that's the meme. Now, I'm a I'm going to present a contrarian view about that because for all the years I would say that I would parrot what I was taught, which was, yes, there was sacrifice, animal sacrifice, and it's over and done with. And frankly, good riddance. The only thing left of the priestly biblical Judaism is they get the first two aliot in an Orthodox shul. Uh, the Kohanes and the Levies, and also for Pidyon Haben, you need a Kohen for that ritual, which almost no one does. And so there's a, they're, they're basically gone. And they replaced it with the smartest Jewish guy gets to be a rabbi, which ended with us. And <laughs> that's, they're basically, the smart ones became rabbis. And, and it wasn't inherited. And in fact, in the early days, they didn't even have formal ordination. That didn't happen until the end of the second century when 
the Tanaim yielded to the Amoraim. And so they changed everything. Now, my view about this is that when we threw out biblical Judaism and the priesthood and animal sacrifice, basically a good thing, we threw out the baby with the bathwater. And that baby is the single greatest weakness of Judaism in our time. It's the weakness of rabbinic Judaism. They had no choice, they had no options, but it was a weakness. And that weakness is we gave up a visceral, thick, in philosophy we say that a thick idea, we say that a thick, real, dramatic, important concept of sacrifice. And in Judaism, till this day, we don't really have a replacement for the notion of giving something of value, deep value to God. And that's my take on it now. Well, let's pursue that for just a moment. So no, okay. The, the notion, no, but, but, you know, there is a notion in rabbinic Judaism of Kiddush Hashem, of uh, under certain circumstances, Mark. Yeah, very uh, limited. Yeah, but, but the, the notion of giving up um, your life. Yeah, but but this it, you don't have to give up your life. I mean, the the, the, the notion yeah. of devoting your devoting yourself, the, the the notion of devotion. Let, let's take that idea of really giving yourself to an ideal, of sacrificing self to an ideal. Uh, what of, does that mean, Eddie? Tell me what you think that means. Well, I, but th that's the question. I mean, you know, the the tradition is trying to reach to an idea that 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 one's fulfillment as a person is not about acquiring stuff, which is sort of the American consumerist ideal. Yeah. Devotion to something bigger, devotion to family, devotion to community, devotion to ideals, devotion to the land of Israel. Take the kid in my community who goes, uh, who we graduates high school and instead of going off to college, goes and serves as a lone soldier in Israel for two and a half, three years. That's sacrifice. That's yes. clearly sacrifice. That's yeah, clearly and, I, and, and there's something, you know, where really scares the hell out of his mother, of course, but yeah. there's something truly inspiring and idealist, idealistic about that. A, a kid who says the Jewish state means that much to me, that I'm going to go and devote two, three years of my life to its defense. Okay, but that's Zionism and sacrifice for Zionism. Right. And that's great, and that's impressive, and we're all on that. I'm talking about sacrifice in Judaism. Yeah. Where is it? And, and I, I want to add in what you and I were speaking about before we went on air about other religions that seem to have gotten this right. And they don't seem to have the lacuna that we do, which is we lack a viable understanding of sacrifice since the destruction of the temple. And right. that is the Mormons yeah. and their year of service, which you admire and I admire. Years of service, actually. Is it years? I thought it was one year. No, no, no. It's more than that. Girls do two, and I think boys are three. It's, it's a lot. Really? It's yeah. unbelievable. What is it when they're about 18, right? Yeah, they graduate high school, and before they go to college, they go and they do, they go on mission for a number of years, and they represent the church, and they give of themselves to the church in all sorts of forms. I, I went to visit Salt Lake City, and my guide for the, well, I had two guides. I had an elderly couple who went, who did a second mission. They, they reached, they retired from their, their, their work and they offered themselves back to the church to go on mission. And their mission was to be hosts for visiting dignitaries to the church in Salt Lake City. And we had a bunch of young kids, young, young, young men and women, incredibly generous, kind people. They weren't there to convert us. They were, they were there to host us and make us feel welcome and to represent their church. It was a lovely thing to see. It was really love. I, I, I got to tell you something, Mark. There's a few things in world religions that make me jealous. Yes. I felt a lot of jealousy in Salt Lake City. Without I, a theology doubt. is not my theology and the no, religion is not my religion. But the sense of devotion to church, of giving to the church and giving to each other as a community is incredibly powerful. Yes. And I think the, the notion of sacrifice isn't absent, of course, from us. And we can see it in a variety of ways where the DNA, we have a sacrificial DNA that I'm, what I'm really appealing for is not that we should get an idea we never had, yeah. but rather that we should revive an idea that yeah. we once had and that we need desperately to revive. And that is things like 
we were talking about the UJA last time and about all this money that's raised by really very few people who give enormously. And I knew a guy who gave a donation to the UJA. He was not rich, but he was okay. And he gave us so much money that they couldn't afford a stroller for their kid. So they would schlep their kid around in these baby holders and until they could save enough money to buy a stroller because he would rather give that money to sure. Tzedakah. Kid, to yeah. Tzedakah. And remember, I talked about the basement of the Elder Street Synagogue. There was that little Tzedakah wall with the little thing. So people would put, it was, there's a DNA of giving. And, and I knew women, I buried a woman once who every Shabbos, in the shtibels that she lived in, in in Eastern Europe, she would go to the baker who would fire up the ovens on Friday morning and bake the challahs and then let the fire burn out. But the ovens were so hot, they would continue to cook things all the way through Shabbos, which is how they were able to have cholent for Shabbos afternoon. Yeah. And they would bring their pots of cholent in the afternoon on Friday. And then on Saturday, they would take them home. She would bring an extra pot of cholent. And a poor family in her little village would come and get that pot so they would have something to eat on Shabbos. Mm. And she never knew who they were, except that after Shabbos, the pot would be cleaned yep. and brought back. And she would take it and fill it with onions and potatoes and, and meat and flunkin. And, and it would it would be uh put back again on shut that's a sacrifice right that's the kind of and and i, I buried a woman once who who never wanted to who, who oh, never awesome. wanted to buy a dress and her her husband was a her husband was a God, how do you turn off my life i don't want to hear from anybody and so and she he would sew dresses for her and I knew a woman, I buried a woman who, that's when I would hear about all this stuff, the eulogies that I was right. writing. You, you and I, he, she never ate any part of the chicken on Friday night except the wings. Because she, her mother would only eat the wings so that one chicken could feed the whole family. And, and she would just take the little piece of the wing. These were sacrificial Jews. Right. In, Ram, in Maimonides, in, when Maimonides discusses the levels of tzedakah, which is one of the masterpieces of halachic writing, because he gathers that from many different sources in the Talmud and organizes it in a way that all of us are familiar. The introduction to that section, Maimonides says, the defining characteristic of the Jewish people from the time of Abraham is that we are a people of giving, that giving that caring, that sharing, that that level of devotion is the defining Jewish characteristic. Yep. This from a guy who, of course, you know, is such a powerful mind, a cerebral Jew of the of the highest power, and yet he's moved by exactly these stories of of how much giving and and how natural it became. It becomes this kind of you know, it becomes this sort of way of being in the community. And I think that's a very interesting expression of this Torah portion. Definitely. Okay, so now we get to the tough part. The question, and we, that, by the way, that used to be at, clipped on to other good Jewish traits that I was taught we always had, like Jews don't drink, you know, the, now Jews drink, and, and gambling and the whole thing, and, there, and the other, and abuse. The thing that it leads to is this question. What is with the new generation? Do they still have this DNA in them? Does this, does this spirit of giving and sacrificial giving, is it still there? Mm -hmm. Is it still there? You know, and I know how tough it is to raise money from the congregation. And particularly if you go and you ask them for a sacrificial gift. Now, I don't know how to answer this question, Ed, but I don't think, unless you're flippant and, and, and Pollyannish, I don't think you can give a positive answer to this. Uh, it doesn't look good. 
that this spirit of giving has has taken root in a new generation. I'm just not convinced. I think I think your observation, unfortunately, is painfully correct. I think it's painfully correct. Let me suggest a different way to read this, though. Please. Maybe this is maybe this will lead to a way of thinking about it as a as a okay as a remedy. Um, think about the drama for a minute. You you spoke about the drama of sacrifice. Yeah. Right? Which is you know, <laughs> unfortunately, it, it's it's often missing in our prayer services, which have become so bourgeois, right? I mean, you 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 come to Jerusalem, and you bring an animal or you buy an animal. And you carry this animal across the courtyard and you carry or you bring this animal, you lead this animal into, into, the, into the precinct of the priests. And you bring this, this is a living, breathing creature, right? Moo, right? Bah. And you put your hands on the head of that animal. And the priest comes and the priest is dressed in his vestments and the priest says to you, why are you here? And you say, I want to pray for my family. I want to pray for my wife. I want to pray for my, my community. I, I want to give gratitude for the gifts that God has given me. I want to ask for beneficence in the days to come. Whatever the purpose, I want to, I want to repent of sin, right? I, I, want to, I, want to get, I, I know that I wasn't the person I should have been. I want to be better. You, you, you confess out loud the purpose of this visit, of your, your need for communion with the divine. And then what happens is they take this animal and right in front of you, they slaughter this animal. So one of the interpretations of sacrifice is that it's, it's, a, it's a ritual of life and death, that it really is you who are being put on the altar, that you're coming and saying, I am in such need of communion with the divine. I am in such need to... For, for, for God's goodness to be showered on my people and on my family, I'm willing to give up my life for it. And the, and the idea is that in a certain sort of dramatic psychological way, you're the one lying on the altar and the priest is holding the knife over your throat. And at the very last second, they substitute a sheep for Gelman and Gelman walks away. I'm a two sheep type guy. I got... I got a little weight on me. So I was going to say I'm, a bull, but that would have been worse. Yeah, I apologize. I'm definitely I'm bull. I'm sorry. But the point is, the point is, it is, it is a, you know, you, you confronting life and death. You're, you, what, what's being shoved in your face is your own mortality, the fragility of life, the vulnerability of being a human being, you know, that, that, and, and this, this, this drama of life and death is happening right in front of your eyes. So, okay, that 2,000 has got to be, years right, later, where are we with this? But that has got to be disturbing, upsetting. Yes. That must, must leave you trembling at some point. Sure. It must leave you trembling at some point. Look, again, you and I as rabbis, we, we spend too much time at cemeteries, holding families, crying with families. But even though we're, we, we remain sensitive to that, the fact that we're going twice a week, three times, you know, five times a month, means that we become not accustomed to it, but a, a little bit more. It's a little bit less. No question to, about it. No question. That, but, to, to, but to be this person who comes to, the, comes to the altar and stands with this animal and goes through this rite of life and death has got to leave you with a shaking sense of who I am in the world and what I am in the world and the value of my life in the world and what really matters. The argument we make to anyone when we ask them to give a little tzedakah is like, for God's sakes, what really matters to you? Yeah. What really matters in life? What, what is, your, what is your, your impression onto the world? What have you done in the world? What can you give to the world? And I, I have to think that the sacrificial worship left us with, with that kind of a unsettling shaking inside as we confront our own mortality. And that the, one of the reasons... Maybe an, another reason, because I love what you said before, of course. But another reason why it was included in the Torah was that even though we don't have the right itself anymore, we want to remember, we're going to read the script. We're going to remember what it was like. Tell the story. Tell the story. Read the script. Enact it again virtually, even if we can't actually enact it in life. Because the trembling that we were left with, the upsetting feeling, the sense of vulnerability, it's a sense that all of us get when we go to the cemetery. That there's something, 
you know, the, the dimensions of life are much bigger than we imagine, and the fragility of life is much deeper than we imagine. And therefore, we have to take very good care of the life that we have and the lives that are ours to take care of. I have to think that that's part of the experience. That was part of the motivation. For but, but bring me up. I'm still, I, I, I'm beginning with what you say beautifully to appreciate as I have, and as I began with, a new appreciation of animal sacrifice. Yeah. My teacher, Richard Rubenstein, as I told you, said, called it dramatic catharsis. That's a good it, word for it, right. He was- Crisis pressed. of the soul, right. Yeah, so you, you, you reach dramatic catharsis and, you know, the most I can see in that, in the dramatic, there's two pieces, the dramatic, we need more drama in Judaism, but also we need more of a sense of real sacrificial giving. Uh, and the closest we get is falling on your face in the great Elenu that I know. You're down on the ground in complete humility, prostrate on the ground, you know, and you're praying. And that gave rise to the great joke because the cantor is down and the, the president of the synagogue is so overwhelmed, he goes down on his face. Cantor turns to the rabbi and says, look who thinks he's nothing. Right. <laughs> yeah, but, but the question is, what do we do to teach sacrifice now that it's been gone from us for 2000 years? You can say it was in our DNA, but let me tell you something. 2000 years is a long time to wash out your DNA, yeah. a long time to evolve. Yeah. And I'll, you know, I, I just don't know. I'll tell you the, the place I see it, that I still think it's viable and viable in a, in a truly emotional way. And you have to be old to know this and you have to generally be in Florida to know it or someplace like this. And that's this. All my congregants who would fly every single weekend or at least two or three times a month, fly down to Florida to see mom, to see dad in their and make sure they're okay and that they're taking their meds and that and and down here too. I have a friend whose brother is deal with Parkinson's and every day he goes to see him and and he can't even get out of his chair and and the the care that these people give and I come from a family where my mother taught me this in a way that I can never ever replicate she for 15 years 15 years Eddie my mother drove my father to work and drove him back she could never have a job because of it because my dad had early onset Alzheimer's. And yeah, there's a level of self-sacrifice in that, which is beyond the belief. So there's where I see it alive. Right. The care, kibbutz avaim, there's a sacrificial that, and the best of them, the best of the Jews who do this, don't say a word about, oh, look what I did and I did. No, it's, they're very humble about it. Most yeah. of them that I know, they, no. You have to drag it out of them that they did it. It's just what they do. And is it, isn't you know, it interesting that even telling these stories brings tears to our eyes? Yes. And raises a sense in our hearts that there's something profoundly transcendent about that. And that, I think, is exactly what you're pointing to. And maybe that's the purpose here, is to give us back that sense of inspiration, transcendence, and a push to say, Consider a different way to conceive of yourself and conceive of your own destiny. That's I the Dylan. That's Wait, how about the Dylan line? You you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. This week is Purim, Mark. I want to wish you a happy Purim. Happy Purim. And a good Shabbos. And thank you to everyone for listening. Um, 10 o'clock this morning, we'll be davening here from Valley Beth Shalom. Um, this coming Wednesday, there's Lunch and Learn on Wednesday afternoon, 1230. Wednesday night, we'll have Purim. You're welcome to tune in or there'll be Purim all over the world this Wednesday night. So please tune in and enjoy a little bit of the Megillah. And let's hold on deeply to Rabbi Gelman's beautiful words of the, the power of giving and the power of devotion to change us and to change our world. Thank you so very much. Have a good Shabbos. Good Shabbos, Eddie.